Hi everyone, my name is Mercedes and I'm a physiotherapist and lactation consultant at Vita Health and Wellness in Calgary, Canada. And joining me today is Amber Lang, the occupational therapist at Vita. Hi Amber. Hello, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Good morning. Um, today we're going to be talking about a topic that's uh, really been on my mind quite a bit lately, which is how we experience trauma and distress as a family unit. I'm really excited to pick your brain, ask you some questions and learn from you because I know that this is something that you know quite a bit about and that you have lots to share um, for myself and also for the people who are gonna be watching. So I'm gonna just kind of get started with some questions and I look forward to learning from you. Sounds great. So there've been lots of articles and blogs and social media posts out there referring to what we're currently going through in spring of 2020 as grief or trauma, like the loss of normal and, um, and, and experiencing trauma. Um, of course, it's different for every household, um, but for a lot of people, they might think that these two words are too strong for what they're feeling, like trauma and grief. Um, are the concepts of grief and trauma, are they reserved for extreme situations or is it possible to experience them to different degrees? Like, is it possible that somebody's going through trauma even though they have some good moments, some happy moments? Um, is that possible? What are your thoughts on that? Definitely possible, yes. And, and there's a huge range of what trauma and grief can look like. And one of the ways that I like to look at this are big T trauma versus little T trauma. You don't necessarily have to meet full-on criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder or have experienced something that completely turns your life upside down, although, you know, in a lot of ways this pandemic has, um, but we do, we do, we can, um, we can have either those big traumas that, that are, have a huge impact on our life, and we can also have those little things that are still traumatic. Um, and we know right now this is hitting us all in so many different ways, whether it's job loss or job insecurity, we, we are living in a state of uncertainty and fear we're having to be always on alert and always hypervigilant, going to the grocery store, wearing masks, having to carry hand sanitizer, having to worry about staying, keeping distance from people. We've gone from a world that feels safe to a world where we don't have that same sense of safety and security. So yes, that is, that is trauma and, and grief as well. When you look at the loss of the loss of jobs, the loss of that sense of safety, the loss of our identity, people who are going from being a working parent to suddenly they're now at home parenting and teaching all day. There's, there's a lot of changing of identity that's going on right now. And that is a grief process, not to mention people who actually have lost loved ones or who are, um, who do have sick loved ones, that fear of potentially becoming sick or having a loved one become sick um, is, is very much a grieving process. Um, I think an added challenge is the isolation piece as well, is that we don't have our same support networks that would normally be helpful in a trauma or grief process. Um, and I think when it, when it comes to the good things and the bad things, we, we can still have those happy moments. You can feel two almost opposite things at the same time. You can feel grateful that you're home with your family, but also just really want to get away from your family <laughs> because of all the time that you're spending together. You might, and, and sometimes some of those feelings of, oh, I should feel this way. Social media tells me I should feel this way um, may make us, you know, we can sometimes feel, sh feel shame or guilt about those feelings, which can trigger further feelings of anxiety or mood effects. And so we can be struggling in so many different ways at this point in time. Um, and trying to wear so many different hats, trying to complete everything, all these different roles in a very short amount of time, and we just don't have the time for it. So yes, we're, we're in one way, we're trying to do everything with not a lot of time, with not a lot of resources, in a very unfamiliar world, trying to wear all of these hats, and it's just, it is a, a really challenging place to be right now. And so we're, we're in a place where, it's, it is so important to be able to grasp onto some of those positives, those happy moments, have some of that gratefulness, but also have self-compassion that that's not where we're going to spend all of our time. We're going to have moments where we need to scream or cry or run or hide in, <laughs> hide in the closet <laughs> to just get a few moments to ourselves. Um, may feel like the walls are closing in and, and we can experience both of those at the same time. And to just 
acknowledge those feelings and be okay with them is I think something that we're all going to be striving for. And yeah, it is a time of individual trauma and collective trauma. And I think we're all just trying to, we're trying to find our way through it right now. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people say that they like, they feel like they need a release valve. Um, you know, when your kids are watching you and you just can't like go outside and scream because the neighbors are going to get uh, worried, you know, but sometimes you feel like you just need to. Um, I've also heard a lot of people say that there are more items on their to-do list than there are hours in the day. You know, you always feel kind of behind. Um, and at the same time, you feel like, um, like a lot of parents do when they have newborns, right? That you're like, you're exhausted and, and really not loving all the moments. And at the same time, feeling like you should be enjoying that time because you know, it's precious. And so you feel like you should be enjoying your time at home with your kids. At the same time, you're having to work 40 hours a day and still, you know, kind of keep everything together. It's, it can be overwhelming. That's yeah. a great comparison that, yeah, very, very similar role changes when you become a new parent versus when you go from being the working parent to now being the home parent and, and not to, you know, exclude people who aren't parents. There's also that challenge that when you go from being a working professional or someone who has, you know, social, physical activities, going to the gym, going and, you know, all those things that we do in our community, that sense of freedom isn't there and when you suddenly go from having all of that connection to then being in your home completely on your own or just yourself and your partner um, but I think especially challenging for those people who are living on their own and do have that complete isolation and it, I mean there there are benefits that we can get from from pets but it's still different from having that human interaction. Absolutely yeah I think we're all going through a similar experience but everyone in their unique way mm -hmm. yeah um and so one thing I'd like to explore is that current experience um, from the perspective of the family unit. So what are the children going through? And of course, it's going to be different for every family. Um, but what are the children going through? What are the parents going through? And really, I want to learn from you kind of how one impacts the other and how do we process the current situation and what we're going through and cope in a healthy way as a family. I know that a lot of us have um, coping strategies, they may or may not um, be healthy in the long run. And so how do we do that as a family? How do we support our children? And how do we support ourselves as a unit? Um, I know that I, think I see children, um, especially in the age of my daughter, around four years old, and really throughout childhood, I see them as little scientists, like they're constantly testing and retesting, and they like that repetition to discover what the rules and the boundaries of their world are. Um, and they thrive on routines and limits. A lot of us parents know that. Um, in the first days of the school closures and staying at home, a lot of kids, uh, the things that our children thought would never change, changed. The things that they thought were constant, suddenly they learned could, could not be constant. Um, and so they didn't really understand what was constant anymore, what was reliable anymore. And so I saw a lot of children turn to that retesting. You know, they started to go, okay, what are the new boundaries? Um, and as a parent, initially, I was also trying to figure things out and the new normal and, and everything in, in that very quick transition. Um, and so a lot of us saw it as you know, challenging behaviors. Um, a lot of children I've heard had new toileting issues, even if they were potty trained um, and things like that. So we saw it as like a difficulty, whereas now looking back, it was, I can see that it was that testing and retesting, their little scientist mind was going. Um, so as parents, we're also, we're also going through a similar experience, right? We're trying to figure out, okay, what is my new routine? What is my new, my new normal? To use a phrase that's been uh, thrown around a lot. So I really want to hear from you. When you look at this situation through the lens of occupational therapy and mental health, what do you see? And I completely agree. This is, this is a huge change for the kids. And, and yeah, they've gone from this structured world to this completely 
different world and and we're all trying to figure this out together and for a little kid who doesn't get to see their friends anymore they they don't get to have their social supports um they they don't have their control in their lives and, and i think one of the biggest things to notice or to note is that they feel our stress mm. kids really do rely on the adults around them to help them regulate they don't really have the ability to do that on their own until they're much older. And so when they're kids, they do look to us. So if we're feeling stressed and we're you know, sitting with them trying to homeschool them, but we're worrying about our phone call that's going to come in in three minutes and trying to plan lunch and trying to you know, deal with the other kid and all these things going on, they're going to feel that stress from us. And that's going to impact their ability to you know, stay and do their homework or do their virtual schooling or even just stay regulated in general. Um, they they know what's going on, right? So even even if they can't, you know, they're not, even if they're not actually hearing the news and hearing what's going on, they're hearing the conversations from us, they're noticing that things are different, but they, they may not really have the cognitive abilities to understand what that all means. They just know that something's wrong, something weird is going on, all the things that we used to have control over, all the things that we used to know are different now. And so they're unregulated, we're unregulated, just kind of spirals to <laughs> challenging be challenging behaviors is how we may see it, but really it's their ability to try and grasp what's going on. So I think while a lot of people are trying to figure out where do they put their energy, there there's there is definitely um, a big piece to the best way to support our kids right now is to find some way to regulate ourselves and to be able to co-regulate with them. So how we make that work is going to be a little bit different for every person, but we definitely are going to chat a bit about today about how we can, um, what some of those tools are for regulating ourselves and for helping regulate with our kids. Um, okay. I'm just going to jump in there and ask you, um, I've heard the term, you know, regulation, self-regulation, co-regulation, I'm really quite familiar with those, but some people might not be. Um, can I ask you to just um, kind of explain what those are? Yeah, so, so when we talk about self-regulation, it's our ability to kind of control our emotions or our body states. So when we get, when we lose control, <laughs> whether it's through anger or through anxiety or through frustration, we're sort of in a place where we've, we're a little bit, you know, outside of our, our zone of what we can actually control. Um, when we're calm and we're engaged in our environment and we have control over what we're doing, that's when we're regulated. So when we talk about self-regulation, it's our ability to stay in that, you know, that good place and not, you know, go too far from those things that, that aren't necessarily things that we're doing based on what we want to be doing. Um, and with kids, they need us to help co-regulate. So co-regulate means we're regulating together rather than by ourselves. So okay. self-regulating is a more advanced skill than, yeah, than co-regulating and, adults need it as well. We do need the ability to, to reach out to people. And I think an example of that is when, you know, if you're really struggling and you find, have a tendency to withdraw and isolate, if that would mean that you're struggling with that self-regulation. But then if you think that, you know, think to call, pick up your phone and call a friend or go and talk to a loved one or even reach for your dog, <laughs> then that's kind of an example of that co-regulation and regulating mm -hmm. someone else. So helping our kids regulate is, is huge right now. And to, to expand a little bit on that, when we're babies, we, when we're first born, we have no ability to self-regulate. We right. cry when we need something, a parent comes and changes us, feeds us, cuddles us, soothes us, whatever it might be. And that's all co-regulation. They regulate through their parents. And then we learn over time that self-regulation piece. But we can't, we can't learn it without being taught. And I think one of the things that we see now is kids are, are regressing a little bit. And part of that is that testing their limits, but part of it is just their world has changed. And so they're needing that co-regulation more than they did before. And I think with that regression, we're seeing, just like you said, we're seeing the potty training where a, a child suddenly starts to have some accidents or they start to refuse foods or they start to you know, have more tantrums or fight back a lot more. And that's because they're struggling more with that self-regulation and really needing that co-regulation. So it can be as simple as you know, when your child is starting to act out or show some of these behaviors before going to the kid and thinking, you know, what do I need to do give to my child to help them? First, check in with yourself. So check in, notice, is your jaw tight? Are your shoulders up by your ears? Are you clenching your fists? Are you clenching your pelvic floor? Are you kind of in a hunched position on your tippy toes? Check in with yourself first and take a couple breaths. 
and relax some of those muscle, muscles intentionally that you notice are tight. And once you get yourself regulated, and this can take two or three seconds, it's not like it's a big long process, but just doing that quick check-in, oh wait, I'm clenching my teeth. Okay, I'm gonna unclench my teeth. teeth. And then supporting your child after you've done that, which may be as simple as going over and getting down to their level and looking at them and being fully present with them in that moment and just breathing with them or giving them a hug and breathing with them. You may do something intentional like doing a mindfulness kids activity with them or it may just be you're there, you're breathing with them. Even a hug when they can feel your slow deep breaths can really help them regulate. They feel your energy coming down and it helps them bring their energy down. So that's the opposite of what a lot of us do, I think. <laughs> um, like if a child comes and constantly asks you for screen time or cookies or something like that, we might think of like managing your emotions and controlling your emotions as being like, not going to let my anger out and then just like tightening up. Yeah. Um, but that might not be helpful in that situation. I like your idea of like slow breathing even just for like two or three seconds and getting into that headspace and then dealing with the question about screen time or, or cookies from, from a place of control. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that perspective. Regulate yourself to help regulate them. Yeah, I like that. Thanks, Amber. I think one um, thing to keep in mind is we're not 100% going to do this. This, <laughs> this is something to strive for. It's not something you're going to think of all the time. If you're on a conference call and you've got a lot going on, maybe that's not the moment that that's going to happen. It doesn't mean that you're going to be present with your kids 100% of the time because we know we have a lot going on right now. But in those moments that you can catch it and you realize that you're tense and you, you actually think of doing that quick check-in, it can make such a huge difference. And, but it does take time to kind of get used to it and it's, it's not going to happen every time. Even people who are very, very good at this and practice it all the time are still going to have those times where they just need to go and hide in another room from their kids for a few minutes. And so that, I think it still comes back to that, um, that self-compassion piece as well of not, not expecting ourselves to do this 100% of the time. Yeah, of course. And you touched on some of those regressions that our children might be having. Some of those sounded pretty familiar to me. Um, you said acting more babyish, you know, needing more cuddles, maybe some potty issues, maybe some food issues. Um, what other kinds of things? Like, what about sleep? Like, how, what other kinds of things might we see in our children that we can now be like, aha, this might be a part of this, and here's how I can support myself and support them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think sleep is a huge one that you might notice sleep regressions, or you might notice that your child is talking about nightmares more often. Or as adults, we may be having more sleep troubles or having nightmares, having past stressors come up. So um, if that's happening for us as adults, that might be coming up for our kids as well. So maybe you have a kid who recently learned how to sleep in their own bed and who's been doing great, but all of a sudden they're showing up in your bed in the middle of the night, um, <clears throat> or they're scared to go to sleep at night alone, or they're more jumpy at some of those noises. So I think it's when you're, when you're noticing these changes in your child, being able to, to step back take those breaths, get into that kind of space where you can view it from that idea that this, this isn't a behavior problem that has emerged. This is our child's attempt to cope with their new world and their lack of normalcy and their lack of control. And so how do we, how do we support them through that regulation by being there for them and being present for those short periods of time to try and help them get back to where they need to be? And I think being patient and accepting and acknowledging that these things aren't around forever. And mm -hmm. right now, yeah, maybe they do just need those extra cuddles and maybe we can treat that as a good thing and reframe our own minds about thinking of that as, you know, bonus time with them. It doesn't mean that the full 24 hours a day, seven days a week feels like bonus time, but in those <laughs> moments to have those, those little cuddles and that togetherness and that presence and that connection um, can really be a good thing for, for parent and child. Yeah, the cuddles have been great. They've been the best part. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, that was really helpful. Um, so what are some of the coping strategies that we do turn to uh, pretty often as, as humans uh, that help in the short term, but not in the long term? Like what, 
I'm curious to hear from you, what are the, some of those things that a lot of us do, but that later on um, might be counterproductive? Yeah, and I think if we think of unhealthy coping strategies, there's certain things that tend to jump out, like using alcohol or um, overeating, sugar, withdrawal, um, over-engaging in things. So some people tend to go to um, spending a lot of energy exercising or the other extreme, spending a lot of time in bed. Sometimes it's snapping or being more being a lot harsher with those around us, being more irritable. So there can be a lot of different ways that we can uh, we can show we can try and cope with those things in the short term, and that evolves over time. Um, overall, there tend to be two kind of broad categories of how people tend to cope with stress: one being over responder and one being under responder. So over responders are people who tend to go more into anxiety and be very heightened and be more likely to snap or um, it, at work they may really get buried into a project and really try to overdo things and might get into that mentality of okay right now I have all this extra time which we know we really don't um, <laughs> but have that pressure to fill it and do all these things and be as productive as possible um, versus which they may it may be that or it may be more of a, a heightened anxiety where they're just always living in that place of, of fear and anxiety. Um, under responders are people who tend to shut down so tend to withdraw, spend time in bed, not want to reach out to their family members, not want to reach out to their friends, just not be able to function very well. Thinking is a lot harder, so trying to work can be a lot more challenging. And it's still that same anxiety response, but it just comes out in a very different way. And we all have our past experiences. We all have you know, our, our kind of go-to things that we tend to do. And I think one of the important things is starting to recognize that, you know what? I'm stressed. I have these tendencies when I get stressed. So what can I do about it? Am I okay with this? Did this work for the first couple weeks of, you know, March, beginning of April, but what do I want to start doing going forward to be able to cope with that stress a little bit differently, knowing that, you know, we can't continue to cope in some of those unhealthy ways. Well, we can, but it's not necessarily, you know, helpful <laughs> to cope those ways for a long period of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, that a lot of that sounds familiar. <laughs> um, I think I've heard a lot of people, again, I'm kind of drawing on what I've seen on, on social media and through conversations with people. I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, they're, they're using this opportunity that they're home all day to like declutter and tidy up the house. Um, but a lot of those do donation drop-off places are not taking things. And so there's, there's a conundrum there because um, yeah, there's this drive to just like, take on projects, even though we, we feel overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. And I think a challenge is when we see other people doing that, there can be pressure to do that. And I think it very much depends on your circumstance that yes, on one hand, if you're a working parent, who's also parenting and doing school and trying to keep your job and doing all of those things, you're probably going to have zero, less than zero time to try and do some of those other projects, but you might feel the pressure from other people. And that can lead to more of those feelings of, of shame and guilt and I should be doing this and getting into some of those patterns. Um, whereas someone who has is temporarily off work and is stuck and isolated at home on their own may feel that because I'm isolated and I can't do anything else, but same thing, they may go into the same pattern of I should be doing all these things, I have all this time, I need to be productive. But when you look at it through trauma and grief and loss of identity, often we're not in a headspace where we can be productive and that putting that pressure on ourselves to be productive can be so detrimental to our mental health. So it doesn't really matter whether you're on the extreme of over busy or the extreme of everything has kind of been taken away and you're now just trying to, to find a way to cope. Yeah. There's that challenge of being able to not take on that pressure from what you see in the news or what you see in social media and to find out what works for you and to be patient and compassionate with yourself. Yeah, and if you're an under responder and you like stop answering the phone and you push people away, um, then you don't get that co-regulation that you were talking about earlier. Exactly, yeah. yeah. No matter so, what your situation it is, it's, it's figuring out what works for you. Yeah, um, and so going back to grief and trauma then, what are some of those evidence-based ways to manage as we're living those experiences or shortly after when we start to try to transition 
um, back to whatever our new life is going to be, um, or even just right now, like what, what is a good way to, to manage right now or to cope right now that can be helpful? Yeah, and I, there, there definitely are things that we can do right now, and there's also things that we may want to do later. So right now, those, those things like taking the time to stop and to check in with yourself can be huge. And, and it's not just about, okay, where, is, where I need to regulate to help my child, but how do you regulate to help yourself? So when you notice yourself feeling stressed, you notice yourself feeling teary or feeling on edge or feeling more frustrated, then being able to just check in with your body and say, okay, what am I feeling? Think about it. <laughs> if you can actually name an emotion to it or name a thought and figure out what it is that's kind of attached to that uncomfortable feeling or just this, that kind of distressful thought or feeling, um, then that can take a lot of the power away from it. So simply naming it and finding it in your body. So where, if you're feeling anxiety or you're feeling anger or you're feeling loss, finding the words for it, but then also finding it in your body. Is it like a pit in your stomach? Is it a tightness or a constriction in your chest? Is it a feeling of so much pent up energy that you just need to let it out somewhere? <clears throat> Is it a feeling of emptiness? And when you find that in your body and when you've named it, it really can dial down the intensity of that feeling. And combining that with breathing, and just like we talked about with the child, being able to do that scan, find those tight areas, relax them, breathe into them. Even being able to do slow, deep breaths, they don't necessarily have to be like so overpowered, powerfully <laughs> deep breaths, but just slow, regular breaths can make a huge difference to, to bring that level down as well. Um, and I think a lot of us know that when we say the words calm down, it tends to have a very negative connotation. <laughs> so we're not necessarily going to say to ourselves, hey, you need to calm down. We know that doesn't work on other people. It's probably not going to work that well on ourselves. But to think about dialing down the intensity can be a good way to think about it. doesn't mean that that emotion is going to go away. It just means that we're we're not burying it to make it so that it can come up more powerful later. It's more about acknowledging it, saying hi to it, and then it can go on its way and do its own thing and you can go back to what you're doing. So it's sort of being there with it. It sounds like a lot of people like to do journaling. Yeah. And, and then when you journal, you have to, you know, find words for what you're feeling. Um, and it doesn't have to be like a long diary like dear diary today I did this but it can just be like bullet points you know I felt this emotion and I felt it in my chest or something like that um, and, and doing some of that journaling can be helpful or like with children I know um, sometimes we ask them to to name their emotion and say what are you feeling right now and that that's really helpful for kids too it can be a great way to communicate with them too, that if they don't have the words, that they can say, I'm feeling red or I'm feeling blue. Blue, we tend to think of as sad, especially if you've seen um, Inside Out, <laughs> some of the, or if you, your child has seen that movie, it can be a good way to communicate with some of those, uh, naming those colors. And, and yeah, it's, some of it is, is what we do internally and some of it is also what we do externally. So journaling or coloring or painting or doing puzzles some kind of making some time in your day for an activity that is regulating. And that may be choosing to sit down on Netflix and watch your favorite show. There's a difference between intentionally saying, I really like the show. I am choosing to spend some time vegging on the couch and watching a show I really like than to pass out on the couch with the TV in the background for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference and it can be very regulating to, <clears throat> to have some of that screen time as an adult too. So, yeah. yeah. And I have read... Um, I cannot remember where, so I won't be able to link the article, but I've read that um, activities involving side-to-side side, side side eye movements can help with processing experiences and that self-regulation. And when I read this, I was really happy because as a knitter, I know that that's one activity that helps me to feel calm and focused, um, but I haven't done much knitting lately because it feels almost frivolous, like it's, it's at the bottom of my to-do list. Right? I have to get all my other things done because that's kind of me time. But I know that when I'm knitting, um, it does calm me down and it makes me focused and it then helps me you know, deal with whatever's next 
um, in my day. Um, I have been spending a lot of time in front of a laptop, which is not normal for me as a physiotherapist. I d physiotherapists are not generally computer people. Um, we, are, we are moving people. As you can see, I shift a lot, I fidget a lot. So I'm not used to sitting and, and being in front of a computer. Um, what's your understanding in terms of those eye movements versus activities where we have like focused vision? I know that with athletes too, um, you know, if they're feeling, if they're feeling a lot of stress or nervousness before an event, they might feel their vision tunneling and, and we encourage them to do things that'll broaden their gaze. Um, so what's your understanding of that? And someone's wanting to integrate some of these techniques into what they're already doing. What are some ways of doing that? Because I know that a lot of people don't have time to set aside and like, and start a knitting project or learn to knit right now. Um, so what are the, some of the ways that they can do that without adding something else into their day? Mm -hmm. And I think there's two pieces to the eye piece. There's the narrow versus wide gaze, and then there's the actual movement between the two sides of the brain, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and we, we do know that there are several treatment mo modalities that are based on that idea of the lateral eye movements, um, primarily thinking of eye movement desensitization therapy or EMDR, um, as well as accelerated resolution therapy. And there are both treatments that include that um, are intended for processing trauma or other strong emotions through integration of both sides of the brain, bilateral stimulation, um, <clears throat> really intended to integrate different parts of the brain, such as our emotional brain and our logical brain and help create kind of coherent stories. And so during our lives, when we're processing this, this collective trauma, having those lateral eye movements can help with sort of um, just helping grasp what's all going on right now. Okay. We also know that when our vision is narrow, we tend to be in, in a more negative state of mind. So we tend to, we're more likely to perceive things negative, to feel a little, little bit more of that kind of freeze response or isolation response. When we have narrow vision um, versus when we have wide vision, we tend to be more engaged with our world. <clears throat> so if you were to read an email on a little cell phone versus on a big computer, we're more likely to interpret that email as negative on a phone than on a screen. Really? That's very interesting. So if right now we're spending a lot of our time, I mean, a, a screen is still not anywhere near as ideal as the entire world, <laughs> right? So even if we're spending our whole day at home staring at a computer screen, similar to we would at work, um, <clears throat> but we're, we're going to potentially be more in that negative place. <clears throat> versus like in <laughs> okay versus like in a meeting around a boardroom table where you're like yeah. talking to people and having to look all around where like if you're in a zoom meeting or whatever platform you're just like you're looking here physical interaction yeah and especially if you're on an audio call staring at your computer screen you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction right. and we know that having a like a facetime phone call with a family member or friend it gives us more of that co-regulation than just a phone call. Mm -hmm. Voice is better than text. Face-to-face -face on technology is better than just a phone call, but in person is that much better. So it can be little things, like if you're out for a walk, making eye contact with the person across the street. We know that right now everyone's kind of in their bubble and almost trying to avoid any kind of interaction with people. But we also know that looking at someone across the street isn't you know any more dangerous than not looking at the person across the street <laughs> so doing those little things like actually making the effort to wave to say hi from across the street to make eye contact with those people around you and you know have a little bit of a smile can can make a huge difference for bringing ourselves into that more positive regulated place versus being shut down and avoiding all those human interactions can can be negative and so when you think about the wide gaze versus and including kind of those the social interaction piece and the lateral eye movements going for a walk noticing the trees noticing what's around you if you're walking with your kids get them to point out maybe you're playing i spy like hey look for something that you can see that's blue and they're really looking around and they're incorporating all those different things um, when you're doing things in the house, even like having having a child watching something on a or playing on a tablet may be more harmful kind of from that eye gaze perspective than watching something on a bigger TV because then at least their eyes are moving a little bit. It's, okay. you know, it's, it's like those little changes. 
Yeah, but then incorporating those real life activities like puzzles, like painting, like coloring, like pretend play. Um, so both for ourselves and for our kids. Okay. Yeah, yeah, jigsaw puzzles I know um, I really like to do as well because, you know, you're looking at the puzzle and then you look at your pile of pieces and you're going back and forth. Yeah, that's sad side eye movement. Yeah, those are really good ones, thanks. Um, and so coming back to um, the notion of going through this as a family unit, are there any benefits to, I mean, I think you kind of answered this, but there are benefits to doing these activities together, right? Or is it better to have parents self-regulate and then come into their activities in that state? Or is it better to um, kind of go through it together? Which is, which is the better approach? I think both um, and either or depending on what works for you but I think if you do that very very brief check-in like a one to two second you know max three second check in with yourself first make sure you're not holding your breath release that tight area in your jaw or wherever your your tenant kind of go-to area is as you're walking over to your child then you're already a little bit regulated and then you can do that regulation together and there's different ways that you can do family mindfulness activities as a family unit. You may pull out a formal activity. Some of my favorites that I do with my girls are um, hot chocolate breath. So I'll say if they're you know not feeling regulated, I'll pull this out with them and I'll do it myself as well because I know it helps me where it's you know, pull your bowl of hot chocolate and take a breath in through your nose and blow on your hot chocolate. And we do it together a few times. Um, another favorite is blowing on a candle and you can kind of work you can go to their level and I think that's one of the challenges is if your child is way up here and you're trying to do an activity that's you know, very calming down here you kind of have to start at their level right. so something where a candle breath might be if they're really really heightened you might say blow on the candle as hard as you can okay blow a little bit lighter blow a little bit lighter this time you're only going to blow so light that you just make the candle flame flicker so you can play around with that a little bit um, to really yeah find their energy Reg, pre do that tiny self-regulation first and then do it with them and incorporate it in, in, into different activities that maybe it's turning on a song you love and they love and having a little you know impromptu dance party in the moment <laughs> to have that togetherness maybe it's sitting down and watching a favorite color or favorite movie maybe it's coloring something together um, but really yeah finding ways that you can incorporate those self-regulation techniques into your actual life um, rather than trying to add it uh, as something that you're doing on top of everything else. Yeah, I'm finding with my daughter, um, we're doing a lot of video calls um, and she's not at an age where she can converse with people. And so she does parallel play. And for anybody who doesn't know uh, what that term means, parallel play is when two kids, you know, play the same thing at the same time beside each other. And they're kind of like looking at each other, but they're not actually playing together. Um, back and forth and conversations are kind of like that too like children will have parallel conversations to somebody else but not actual dialogue unless they're prompted and so we've been finding that it helps to have her doing some artwork or coloring uh, while she's doing her video calls or to play charades with the other person or something like that um, in in much the same way so that because um, she can find those activities to be um, really challenging, uh, even though she does enjoy them. Yeah. And it may um, be also picking the time, right? So it may not be the time that's most convenient for the adult, but noticing that, you know, if the time that works that you have planned to have this phone call, if, you, if your child is not in the right headspace, then maybe it's postponing that so that you can do that at a time that they are in a better place to be able to do that. And yeah, having those lowering your expectations <laughs> to what's realistic for what your child is able to handle at that time. For sure. Well, this has been really helpful. Thank you, Amber. I know I've learned a lot. I can imagine that um, people who have watched this video have also learned a lot. And I'm really eager to learn from them as well. Like you said, you started bringing things up. And as a parent, I drew on my experiences and, and some examples as well. So I'm really wanting to learn from other parents and other uh, health professionals as well if they've got ideas. I think that we can kind of crowdsource and get through this together. Um, so if anybody has things that work for them or things that they've tried, please leave a comment uh, in the comment section below. 
And if you enjoyed this video and you want to hear more from Amber and from me, you want to learn about women's health, family health, uh, we do breastfeeding and pelvic health as well. Uh, feel free to subscribe or follow us on social media. If you're in Alberta, Northwest Territories, or Nunavut, and you want to see more of Amber and get some one-on-one -on -one individualized health for you and your family, you can always book an appointment with Amber. So check out our website and there will be links to make an appointment with Amber there. And have a wonderful day. Thank you, Amber. This is awesome. Thank you. Bye, everybody.